Book Three, Chapter Four of *The Mind and the Brain*. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. *The Mind and the Brain* by Alfred Binet, F. Leg, Editor. Book Three, *The Union of the Soul and the Body*. Chapter Four, Modern Theories. It may be thought that the objection taken above to parallelism and materialism is personal to myself, because I have put it forward as the consequence of my analysis of the respective shares of thought and matter in every act of cognition. This is not so. I am here in harmony with other philosophers who arrived at the same conclusions long before me, and it may be useful to quote them. We will begin with the Prince of Idealists, Berkeley. Everything you know or conceive other than spirits, says Philonus to Hylas, is but your ideas. So then, when you say that all ideas are occasioned by impressions made in the brain, either you conceive this brain, or you do not. If you conceive it, you are in that case talking of ideas imprinted in an idea which is the cause of this very idea, which is absurd. If you do not conceive it, you are talking unintelligibly. You are not forming a reasonable hypothesis. How can it be reasonable, he goes on to say, to think that the brain, which is a sensible thing, that is, which can be apprehended by the senses, an idea consequently which only exists in the mind, is the cause of our other ideas. Note. I borrow this quotation from Renouvier, Le Personalisme, Page 263. End note. Thus, in the reasoning of Berkeley, the function of the brain cannot explain the production of ideas, because the brain itself is an idea, and an idea cannot be the cause of all our other ideas. Monsieur Bergson's argument is quite similar, although he takes a very different standpoint from that of idealism. He takes the word image in the vaguest conceivable sense. To explain the meaning of this word, he simply says, Images which are perceived when I open my senses, and unperceived when I close them. He also remarks that the external objects are images, and that the brain and its molecular disturbances are likewise images. And he adds, For this image which I call cerebral disturbance to generate the external images, it would have to contain them in one way or another and the representation of the whole material universe would have to be implicated in that of this molecular movement. Now it is enough to enunciate such a proposition to reveal its absurdity. Note. Matière Memoir, page 3. The author has returned to this point more at length in a communication to the Congrès de Philosophie de Genève in 1904. See Revue de Métaphysique et de Morale, November 1904, communication from H. Bergson entitled Le Paralogisme Psychophysiologique. Here is a passage from this article which expresses the same idea. To say that the image of the surrounding world issues from this image, from the cerebral movement, or that it expresses itself by this image, or that it arises as soon as this image is suggested, or that one gives it to oneself by giving oneself this image, would be to contradict oneself, since these two images, the outer world and the intracerebral movement, have been supposed to be of the same nature, and the second image is, by the hypothesis, an infinitesimal part of the field of representation, while the first fills the whole of it. End note. It will be seen that this reasoning is the same as Berkeley's, though the two authors are reasoning on objects that are different. According to Berkeley, the brain and the states of conscience are psychical states. According to Bergson, the definition of the nature of these two objects designated by the term image is more comprehensive, but the essential of his argument is independent of this definition. It is enough that the two terms should be of similar nature for one to be unable to generate the other. My own argument, in its turn, 
comes rather near the preceding ones. For the idea of Berkeley and the image of Bergson, I substitute the term matter. I say that the brain is matter, and that the perception of any object is perception of matter, and I think it is not easy to explain how from this brain can issue this perception, since that would be to admit that from one matter may come forth another matter. There is certainly here a great difficulty. Monsieur Bergson has thought to overcome it by attacking it in the following way. He has the very ingenious idea of changing the position of the representation in relation to the cerebral movement. The materialist places the representation after this movement and derives it from the movement. The parallelist places it by the side of the movement and an equivalence to it. Monsieur Bergson places it before the movement and supposes it to play with regard to it the part of exciting cause or simply that of initiator. This cerebral movement becomes an effect of the representation and a motor effect. Consequently, the nervous system passes into the state of motor organ. The sensory nerves are not, as supposed, true sensory nerves, but they are the commencements of motor nerves, the aim of which is to lead the motor excitements to the centers which play the part of commutators and direct the current, sometimes by one set of nerves, sometimes by others. The nervous system is like a tool held in the hand. It is a vehicle for action, we are told, and not a substratum for cognition. I cannot here say with what ingenuity, with what powerful logic, and with what close continuity of ideas Monsieur Bergson develops his system nor with what address he braves its difficulties. His mind is remarkable alike for its power of systematization and its suppleness of adaption. Before commencing to criticize him, I am anxious to say how much I admire him, how much I agree with him throughout the critical part of his work, and how much I owe to the perusal of his book, Matière et Memoire. Though I was led into metaphysics by private needs, though some of the ideas I have set forth above were conceptions of my own, for example, the criticism of the mechanical theory of matter and the definition of sensation, before I had read M. Bergson's book, it cannot be denied that its perusal has so strongly modified my ideas that a great part of these are due to him without my feeling capable of exactly discerning which. For ideas have a much more impersonal character than observations and experiments. It would therefore have been ungrateful to criticize him before having rendered him this tribute. There are, in M. Bergson's theory, a few assertions which surprise us a little, like everything which runs counter to old habits. It has always been supposed that our body is the receptacle of our psychological phenomenon. We store our reminiscences in our nerve centers. We put the state of our emotions in the perturbations of certain apparatus. We find the physical basis of our efforts of will and of attention in the sensations of muscular tension born in our limbs or trunk. Directly we believe that the nervous system is no longer the depository of these states. We must change their domicile, and where are they to be placed? Here the theory becomes obscure and vague, and custom renders it difficult to understand the situation of the mind outside the body. M. Bergson places memory in planes of consciousness far removed from action, and perception he places in the very object we perceive. If I look at my bookcase, my thought is in my books. If I look at the sky, my thought is in a star. Note. Matière et mémoire, page 31. End note. It is very difficult to criticize ideas such as these, because one is never certain that one understands them. I will therefore not linger over them, notwithstanding the mistrust which they inspire in me. But what seems to me to require proof is the function M. Bergson is led to attribute to the sensory nerves. To his mind, it is not exact to say that the excitement of a sensory nerve excites sensation. This would be a wrong description, for, according to him, every nerve, even a sensory one, serves as a motor. It conducts the disturbance which, passing through the central commutator, flows finally into the muscles. But then, whence comes it 
that I think I feel a sensation when my sensory nerve is touched. Whence comes it that a pressure on the epitrochlear nerve gives me a tingling in the hand? Whence comes it that a blow in the eyeball gives me a fleeting impression of light? One must read the page where Monsieur Bergson struggles against what seems to me the evidence of the facts. If for one reason or another, he says, the excitement no longer passes, it would be strange if the corresponding perception took place, since this perception would then put our body in relation with points of space which would no longer invite it to make a choice. Divide the optic nerve of any animal. The disturbance starting from the luminous point is no longer transmitted to the brain, and thence to the motor nerves. The thread which connected the external object to the motor mechanism of the animal by enveloping the optic nerve is severed. The visual perception has therefore become powerless, and in this powerlessness consists unconsciousness. This argument is more clever than convincing. It is not convincing because it consists in exaggerating beyond all reason a very real fact. That of the relation which can be discovered between our sensations and our movements. We believe, with M. Bergson, that it is absolutely correct to see in action the end and the raison d'etre of our intelligence and our sensibility. But does it follow that every degree, every shade, every detail of sensation, even the most insignificant, has any importance for the action? The variations of sensibility are much more numerous than those of movements and of adaption. Very probably, as seen in an attentive study of infancy, sensibility precedes the power of motion in its differentiations. A child shows an extraordinary acuteness of perception at an age when its hand is still very clumsy. The correlation, then, is not absolute. And then, even if it were so, it would not follow that the suppression of any movement would produce by rebound the suppression of the sensation to which this movement habitually corresponds. On this hypothesis, a sensation which loses its motor effect becomes useless. Be it so, but this does not prove that the uselessness of a sensation is synonymous with insensibility. I can very well imagine the movement being suppressed, and the useless sensation continuing to evoke images and to be perceived. Does this not occur daily? There are patients who, after an attack of paralysis, remain paralyzed in one limb, which loses the voluntary movement, but does not necessarily lose its sensibility. Many clear cases are observed in which this disassociation takes place. I therefore own that I cannot follow M. Bergson in his deduction. As a physiologist, I am obliged to believe firmly in the existence of the sensory nerves, and therefore I continue to suppose that our conscious sensations are consequent to the excitement of these nerves and subordinate to their integrity. Now, as therein lies, unless I mistake, the essential postulate, the heart of M. Bergson's theory, by not admitting it, I must regretfully reject the whole. End of Book 3, Chapter 4 Recording by Dale Kerwin Ottawa, 2007this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lucy Burgoyne. The Mind and the Brain by Alfred Binet. F. Legg, Editor. Book 3, Chapter 5, Conclusion. A few convinced materialists and parallelists to whom I have read the above criticisms on their systems have found no answer to them. My criticisms have appeared to them just, but nevertheless they have continued to abide by their own systems, probably because they were bound to have one. 
we do not destroy an erroneous idea when we do not replace it by another. This has decided me to set forth some personal views which, provisionally, and for want of better, might be substituted for the old doctrines. Before doing this, I hasten to explain their character, and to state openly that they are only hypotheses. I know that metaphysicians rarely make avowals of this kind. They present their systems as a well-connected whole, and they set forth its different parts, even the boldest of them, in the same dogmatic tone, and without warning that we ought to attach very unequal degrees of confidence to these various parts. This is a deplorable method, and to it, is perhaps due the kind of disdain that observers and experimentalists feel for. Metaphysics, a disdain often without justification, for all is not false, and everything is not hypothetical, in metaphysics. There are in it demonstrations, analysis, and criticisms, especially the last, which appear to me as exact and as certain as an observation or experiment. The mistake lies in mixing up together in a statement, without distinction, the certain with the probable, and the probable with the possible. Metaphysicians are not wholly responsible for this fault of method, and I am much inclined to think that it is the natural consequence of the abuse of speculation. It is especially by the cultivation of the sciences of observation that we foster in ourselves the precious sense of proof, because we can check it any minute by experimental verification. When we are working at a distance from the facts, this sense of proof gets thinner, and there is lost that feeling of responsibility and fear of seeing one's assertions contradicted by a decisive, countervailing observation, which is felt by every observer. One acquires the unbearable pride which I note in Kant, and one abandons oneself to the spirit of construction. I am speaking from personal experience. I have several times detected within me this bad spirit of construction. I have been seeking to group several facts of observation under the same idea, and then I have discovered that I was belittling and depreciating those facts which did not fit in with the idea. The hypothesis I now present on the relations of the mind and the brain has, for me, the advantage of bringing to light the precise conditions which a solution of this great problem must satisfy for this solution to be worthy of discussion. These conditions are very numerous. I shall not indicate them all successively, but here are two which are particularly important. 1. The manifestations of the consciousness are conditioned by the brain. Let us suspend, by any means, the activity of the encephalic mass, by arresting the circulation of the blood, for example, and the physic function is at once inhibited. Compress the carotid, and you obtain the clouding over of the intellect, or instead of a total abolition, you can have one in detail. Sever a sensory nerve with the bistouri, and all the sensations which that nerve transmits to the brain are suppressed. Consciousness appears only when the molecular disturbance reaches the nerve centers. Everything takes place in the same way as if this disturbance released the consciousness. Consciousness also accompanies or follows certain material states of the nerve centers, such as the waves which traverse the sensory nerves, which exercise reflex action in the cells, and which propagate themselves in the motor nerves. 
It is to the production of the distribution and the integrity of this nervous influx that the consciousness is closely linked. It there finds one of the conditions of its apparition. 2. On the other hand, the consciousness remains in complete ignorance of these intracerebral phenomena. It does not perceive the nerve wave which sets it in motion. It knows nothing of its peculiarities, of its trajectory, or the length of its course. In this sense it may be said that it is in no degree an anatomist. It has no idea of all the peculiarities of the nerve wave which form part of its cerebral history from the moment when these peculiarities are out of relation with the properties of external objects. One sometimes wonders that our consciousness is not aware that the objects we perceive with our two eyes correspond to a double undulation, namely, that of the right and that of the left, and that the image is reversed on the retina, so that it is the rods of the right which are impressed by objects on our left, and the rods of the upper parts by objects below our eyes. These are, it has been very justly said, factitious problems, imaginary difficulties which do not exist. There is no need to explain, for instance, direct vision by a reversed image, because our consciousness is not aware that the image on the retina is reversed. In order to take account of this, we should require another eye to see this image. This answer appears particularly to the point. It will be found that it is absolutely correct if we reflect that this case of the unfelt inversion of the image on the retina is but one example of the anatomical ignorance of the consciousness. It might also be declared in the same order of ideas that our consciousness is ignorant, that excitements of the eye cross each other at the level of the chiasma and pass through the internal capsule, and that the majority of the visual excitements of an eye are received by the opposite hemisphere. A rather confused notion of these facts has formed itself in the minds of several critics, and I can discern the proof of this in the language they use. It will be said, for example, that the idea exists in the consciousness or in the mind, and phrases like the following will be avoided. I think with my brain the suggestion consists in introducing an idea in the brain. The nerve cell perceives and reason, etc. Ordinarily, these forms of speech are criticized because they appear to have the defect of establishing a confusion between two irreducible elements, the physical and the mental. I think the error of language proceeds from another cause, since I do not admit this distinction between the physical and the mental. I think that the error consists in supposing vaguely that the consciousness comprehends intracerebral phenomena, whereas it ignores them. Let me repeat that there is no such thing as intracerebral sensibility. The consciousness is absolutely insensitive with regard to the dispositions of the cerebral substance and its mode of work. It is not the nervous undulation which our consciousness perceives, but the exciting cause of this wave, that is, the external object. The consciousness does not feel that which is quite close to it, but is informed of that which passes much further off. Nothing that is produced inside the cranium interests it. It is solely occupied with objects of which the situation is extracranial. It does not penetrate into the brain. We might say, but spreads itself like a sheet 
over the periphery of the body, and thence springs into the midst of the external objects. There is, therefore, I do not say a contradiction, but a very striking contrast between these two facts. The consciousness is conditioned, kept up, and nourished by the working of the cerebral substance, but knows nothing of what passes in the interior of that substance. This consciousness might itself be compared to a parasitical organism, which plunges its taproots into the nerve centres, and of which the organs of perception, borne on long stalks, emerge from the cranium and perceive everything outside that cranium. But this is, of course, only a rough image. Strictly, it is possible to explain this distribution of the conscious, singular as it is at first sight, by those reasons of practical utility which are so powerful in the history of evolution. A living being has to know the world external to himself in order to adapt and pre-adapt himself to it, for it is in this outer world that he finds food, shelter, beings of his own species, and the means of work, and it is on this world of objects that he acts in every possible way by the contractions of his muscles. But with regard to the intracephalic actions, they are outside the ordinary sphere of our actions. There is no daily need to know them. We can understand that the consciousness has not found very pressing utilitarian motives for development in that direction. One must be a histologist or a surgeon to find an appreciable interest in studying the structure of the nerve cell or the topography of the cerebral centres. We can therefore explain well enough by the general laws of adaption, the reason of the absence of which might be called cerebral sensibility, but here as elsewhere the question of the why is much easier to solve than that of the how. The question of the how consists in explaining that the consciousness directly aroused by a nerve wave does not perceive this undulation, but in its deed the external object. Let us first note that between the external object and the nervous influx there is the relation of cause to effect. It is only the effect which reaches us, our nerve cells and our consciousness. What must be explained is how a cognition, if such a word may be employed here, of the effect can excite the consciousness of the cause. It is clear that the effect does not resemble the cause, as quality, the orange I am looking at, has no resemblance with the brain wave, which at this moment is transversing my optic nerve. But this effect contains everything which was in the cause, or, more exactly, all that part of the cause of which we have perception. Since it is only by the intermediary of our nervous system that we perceive the object, all the properties capable of being perceived are communicated to our nervous system and inscribed in the nerve wave. The effect produced, therefore, is the measure of our perception of the cause. This is absolutely certain. All bodies possesses an infinity of properties which escape our cognitions, because, as excitants of our organism, these properties are wanting in the intensity or the quality necessary to make it vibrate. They have not been tuned in unison with our nervous cords. And, inversely, all we perceive of the mechanical, physical, and chemical properties of a body is contained in the vibration this body succeeds in propagating through our cerebral atmosphere. There is in this a phenomenon of transmission analogous 
to that which is produced when an air of music is sent along a wire. The whole concert heard at the other extremity of the wire has travelled in the form of delicate vibrations. There must therefore exist, through unperceived by our senses, a sort of kinship between the qualities of the external objects and the vibrations of our nerves. This is sometimes forgotten. The theory of the specific energy of the nerves cause it to be overlooked, as we see that the quality of the sensation depends on the nerve that is excited. One is inclined to minimize the importance of the excitant. It is relegated to the position of approximate cause with regard to the vibration of the nerve, as the striking of a key on the piano is the proximate cause of the vibration of a string, which always gives the same degree of sound, whether struck by the forefinger or third finger, or by a pencil or any other body. It will be seen at once that this comparison is inexact. The specific property of our nerves does not prevent our knowing the form of the excitant, and our nerves are only comparable to piano strings if we grant to these the property of vibrating differently according to the nature of the bodies which strike them. How is it that the nerve wave if it be the depository of the whole of the physical properties perceived in the object, resembles it so little. It is because, this is my hypothesis, these properties, if they are in the undulation, are not there alone. The undulation is the work of two collaborators. It expresses both the nature of the object which provokes it, and that of the nervous apparatus which is its vehicle. It is like the furrow traced in the wax of the phonograph, which expresses the collaboration of an aerial vibration with a stylus, a cylinder, and a clockwork movement. This engraved line resembles, in short, neither the phonographic apparatus nor the aerial vibration although it results from the combination of the two. Similarly, I suppose that if the nervous vibration resembles so little the excitant which gives it birth, it is because the factor nervous system adds its effect to the factor external object. Each of these factors represents a different property, the external object represents a cognition and the nervous system an excitement. Let us imagine that we succeed in separating these two effects. It will be conceived theoretically that a separation of this kind will lay bare the hidden resemblances, given to each collaborator the part which belongs to it. The excitement, for instance, will be suppressed, and the cognition will be retained. Is it possible to make, or at least to imagine, such analysis? Perhaps, for of these two competing activities, one is bearable, since it depends on the constantly changing nature of the objects which come into relation with us. The other, on the contrary, is a constant, since it expresses the contribution of our nerve substance. And, though this last is a very unstable composition, it necessarily varies much less than the series of excitants. We consequently see faintly that these two elements differ sufficiently in character for us to be able to suppose that they are separable by analysis. But how could this analysis be made? Evidently not by chemical or physical means. We have no need here of regents, prisms, centrifugal apparatus, permeable membranes, or anything of that kind. It will suffice to suppose that it is the consciousness itself 
that is the dialyser. It acts by virtue of its own laws, that is to say, by changes in intensity. Supposing that sensibility increases for the variable elements of the undulation, and becomes insensible for the constant elements, the effect will be the same as a material dissociation by chemical analysis. There will be an elimination of certain elements and the retention of others. Now all we know of the consciousness authorizes us to entrust this role to it, for it is within the range of its habits. We know that change is the law of consciousness, that it is effaced when the excitements are uniform, and is renewed by their differences or their novelty. A continued or too often repeated excitement ceases in time to be perceived. It is to condense these facts into a formula that Bain speaks of the law of relativity of cognition, and, in spite of a few ambiguities on the part of Spencer and of Bain himself in the definition of this law, the formula with the sense I have just indicated is worth preserving. Let us see what becomes of it when my hypothesis is adopted. It explains how certain excitements proceeding from the objects, that is to say, forming part of the variable element, cease to be perceived when they are repeated and tend to become constant. A fortiori, it seems to me, should the same law explain how the constant element, par excellence, the one which never varies from the first hour, is never perceived. There is, in the concert of the sounds of nature, an accompaniment so monotonous that it is no longer perceived, and the melody alone continues to be heard. It is in this precisely that my hypothesis consists. We will suppose a nerve current starting from one of the organs of the senses when it is excited by some object or other, and arriving at the centre of the brain. This current contains all the properties of the object, its colour, its form, its size, its thousand details of structure, its weight, its sonorous qualities, etc., etc., properties combined with and connected by the properties of the nerve organ in which the current is propagated. The consciousness remains insensible to those nervous properties of the current, which are so often repeated that they are annulled. It perceives, on the contrary, its variable and accidental properties, which express the nature of the excitant. By this partial sensibility, the consciousness lays bare that which in the nerve current represents the object that is to say, a cognition, and this operation is equivalent to a transformation of the current into a perception, image, or idea. There is not, strictly speaking, a transformation, but analysis, only the practical result is the same as that of a transformation, and is obtained without its being necessary to suppose the transmutation of a physical into a mental phenomenon. Let us place ourselves now at the moment when the analysis I am supposing to be possible has just been effected. Our consciousness then assists at the unrolling of representations which correspond to the outer world. These representations are not, or do not appear to be, lodged in the brain, and it is not necessary to suppose a special operation which, taking them in the brain, should project them into the periphery of our nerves. This transport would be useless, since for the consciousness the brain does not exist. The brain, with its fibres and cells, is not felt, 
it therefore supplies no datum to enable us to judge whether the representation is external or internal with regard to it. In other words, the representation is only localized in relation to itself. There is no determinate position other than that of one representation in relation to another. We may therefore reject as inexact the pretended law of eccentricity of the physiologists who suppose that sensation is first perceived as it were centrally and then by an added act is localized at the peripheric extremity of the nerve. This argument would only be correct if we admitted that the brain is perceived by the consciousness of the brain. I have already said that the consciousness is not an atomist, and that therefore this problem does not present itself. Such as it is, this hypothesis appears to me to present the advantage of explaining the reason why our consciousness coincides, in certain circumstances, with the actions of the brain, and, in others, does not come near them. In other words, it contains an explanation of the unconscious. I can show this by quoting certain exact facts, of which the explanation has been hitherto thought to present difficulties, but which become very easy to understand on the present hypothesis. The first of these facts relates to the psychology of the motor current. This current has been a great feature in the studies which have been made on the feeling of effort and on the physical basis of the will. The motor current is that which, starting from the cerebral cells of the motor region, travels by way of the fibres of the pyramidal tract into the muscles of the body, and it is centrifugal in direction. Researches have been made as to whether we are or may be conscious of this current, or rather the question has been put in somewhat different terms. It has been asked whether a psychological state can be the counterpart of this motor current. If, for example, the feeling of mental effort produced in us at the moment of executing a difficult act or of taking a grave resolution, might not have this motor current for a basis. The opinion which has prevailed is in the negative. We have recognized a good deal on the faith of experiment, and a little also for theoretical reasons, that no sensation is awakened by the centrifugal current. As to the sensation of effort, it has been agreed to place it elsewhere. We put it among the centripetal sensations which are produced as the movement outlines itself, and which proceed from the contracted muscles, the stretch ligaments, and the frictional movements of the articulations. Effort would therefore form part of all the physical phenomenology, which is the duplicate of those sensory currents which are centripetal in direction. In the long run, I can see no sort of theoretical reasons for subordinating the consciousness to the direction of the nerve current, and for supposing that the consciousness is aroused when this current is centripetal, and that it cannot follow the centrifugal current. But this point matters little. My hypotheses would fairly well explain why the motor current remains unconscious. It explains the affair by taking into consideration the nature of this current and not its direction. This current is a motor one because it is born in the central cells, because it is a discharge from these cells, and is of entirely nervous origin since it does not correspond with the perception of an object, the ever-varying object. It is always the same by nature. 
it does not carry within its monotonous course the debris of an object, as does the sensory current. Thus it can flow without consciousness. This same kind of hypothesis supplies us with the reasons why a given sensory current may be, according to circumstances, either conscious or unconscious. The consciousness resulting from the analysis of the molecular wave is, as it were, a supplementary work, which may be subsequently added to the realized wave. The propagation of the wave is the essential fact there is always time to become conscious of it afterwards. It is thus that we happen, in moments of abstraction, to remain insensible to certain even very powerful excitements. Our nervous system registers them, nevertheless, and we can find them again later on, within the memory. This is the effect of a belated analysis. The converse phenomenon occurs much more frequently. We remark many actions and perceptions which occur the first time with consciousness, emotion, and effort. Then, when they are repeated, as coordination becomes stronger and easier, the reflex consciousness of the operation becomes feebler. This is the law of habit which slowly carries us towards automatism. These observations have even been extended, and the endeavour made to apply them to the explanation of the origin of reflex actions and of instincts, which have all started with consciousness. This is a rather bold attempt, for it meets with many serious difficulties in execution, but the idea seems fairly correct, and is acceptable if we may limit it. It is certain that the consciousness accompanies the effort towards the untried, and perishes as soon as it is realized. Whence comes this singular dilemma propounded to it by nature? To create something new or perish? It really seems that my hypothesis explains this. Every new act is produced by nerve currents, which contain many of those variable elements which the consciousness perceives, but in proportion as the action of the brain repeats itself and becomes more precise and more exact, this variable element becomes attenuated, falls to its lowest pitch, and may even disappear in the fixation of habit and instinct. My hypothesis much resembles the system of parallelism. It perfects it, as it seems to me, as much as the latter has perfected materialism. We indeed admit a kind of parallelism between the consciousness and the object of cognition, but these two series are not independent not simply placed in just a position, as is possible in ordinary parallelism. They are united and fused together so as to complete each other. This new theory appears to me to represent a better form of the series of attempts which have been inspired by the common necessity of making the phenomena of consciousness accord with the determinism of physical facts. I hold fast to this physical determinism, and accept a strictly mechanical conception of the functions of the nervous system. In my idea, the currents which pass through the cerebral mass follow each other without interruption, from the sensorial periphery to the motor periphery. It is they and they alone, which excite the movements of the body by acting on the muscles. Parallelism recognizes all these things, and I do likewise. Let us now see the advantages of this new system. First, it contains no parallelism, no logical or physiological error, since it does not advance the supposition that the mental differs by its nature from the physical phenomenon. 
We have discussed above the consequences of this error. They are here avoided. In the second place, it is explanatory, at least in a certain measure, since the formula we employ allows us to understand better than by the principle of simple juxtaposition why certain nerve currents flow in the light of consciousness, while others are plunged into the darkness of unconsciousness. This law of consciousness, which Bain called the law of relativity, becomes, when embodied with my theory of the relations of the physical to the moral, an explanation of the distribution of consciousness through the actions of the brain. I ask myself whether the explanation I have devised ought to be literally preserved. Perhaps not. I have endeavoured less to present a ready-made solution than to indicate the direction in which we ought to look for one. The law of consciousness which I have used to explain the transformation of a nerve current into perception and images is only an empirical law produced by the generalization of particular observations. Until now there has been, so far as I know, no attempt to ascertain whether this law of consciousness, notwithstanding the general nature which some authors incline to ascribe to it, might not explain itself by some more general facts, and might not fit as a particular case into a more comprehensive frame. To be brief, this is very possible. I have not troubled myself about it, and I have made a transcendental use of this empirical law, for I have impliedly supposed it to be a first principle, capable of accounting for the development of the consciousness, but itself incapable of explanation. If other observers discover that that which to me has appeared inexplicable may be explained by quite peculiar causes, it is clear that my theory must be abandoned or modified. New theories must then be sought for, which will probably consist in recognizing different properties in the consciousness. A little thought will discover several, I have no doubt, by way of suggestion, I will indicate one of these hypothetical possibilities. The consciousness has the faculty of reading in the effect that which existed in the cause. It is not rash to believe that by working out this idea, a certain solution would be discovered. Moreover, the essential is, I repeat, less to find a solution than to take account of the point which requires one, and metaphysics seem to me especially useful when it shows us where the gap in our knowledge exists, and what are the conditions required to fill this gap. Above all, I adhere to this idea, which has been one of the guiding forces of this book. There exists at the bottom of all the phenomena of the intelligence, a duality. To form a true phenomenon, there must be at once a consciousness and an object. According to passing tendencies, either of temperament or of fashion, preponderance has been given sometimes to one of the terms of this couple, sometimes to the other. The idealist declares, thought creates the world. The materialist answers, the matter of the brain creates thought. Between these two extreme opinions, the one as unjustifiable as the other in the excesses they commit, we take up an intermediate position. Looking at the balance, we see no argument capable of being placed in the scale of the consciousness which may not be neutralized by an argument placed in the scale of the object, and if we had to give our final verdict, we should say, the consciousness and matter have equal rights, thus leaving 
to every one the power to place, in this conception of an equality of rights, the hopes of survival of which his heart has need. Footnote. The equivarch, perpetrated by Bain and Spencer, consists in supposing that the consciousness bears solely on differences. This is going too far. I confine myself to admitting that, if sensation is not changed from time to time, the consciousness becomes weaker and disappears. End of Book 3, Chapter 5《ポッドキャスト》第一章「体と心の関係」この音は、LibriVox のレコーディングです。全ての LibriVox のレコーディングは、LibriVox 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 のレコーディングです。I ask permission to reproduce here a communication made by me in December 1904 to the Societe Francaise de Philosophie. I there set forth briefly the ideas which I have just developed in this book. This succinct exposé may be useful as a recapitulation of the argument. Description of Matter The physicists who are seeking for a conception of the inmost structure of matter in order to explain the very numerous phenomena they perceive, fancy they can connect them with other phenomena, less numerous but of the same order. They thus consider matter in itself. We psychologists add to matter something more, viz. the observer. We consider matter and define it by its relations to our modes of knowledge, that is to say, by bearing in mind that it is conditioned by our external perception. These are two different points of view. In developing our own standpoint, we note that of the outer world we are acquainted with nothing but our sensations. If we propound this limit, it is because many observations and experiments show that between the external object and ourselves there is but one intermediary, the nervous system and that we only perceive the modifications which the external object, acting as an excitant, provokes in this system. Let us provisionally apply to these modifications the term sensations, without settling the question of their physical or mental nature. Other experiments, again, prove to us that our sensations are not necessarily similar to the objects which excite them. For the quality of each sensation depends on what is called the specific energy of the nerve excited. Thus, whether the optic nerve be appealed to by a ray of light, an electric current, or a mechanical shock, it always gives the same answer, and this answer is the sensation of light. It follows that our nervous system itself is only known to us as regards its structure by the intermediary of sensations, and we are not otherwise more informed upon its nature than upon that of any other object whatever. In the second place, a much more serious consequence is that all our sensations being equally false, so far as they are copies of the excitants which provoke them, one has no right to use any of these sensations to represent to ourselves the inmost structure of matter. The theories to which many physicists still cling, which consist in explaining all the modalities of matter by different combinations of movement, start from false premises. Their error consists in explaining the whole body of our sensations by certain particular sensations of the eye, of the touch, and of the muscular sense, in which analysis discovers the elements and the source of the representation of motion. Now these particular sensations have no more objective value than those of the tongue, of the nose, and of the ear. 
in so far as they are related to the external excitant, of which it is sought to penetrate the inmost nature, one of them is as radically false as the other. It is true that a certain number of persons will think to escape from our conclusion because they do not accept our starting point. There exist, in fact, several systems which propound that the outer world is known to us directly without the intermediary of a tertium quid, that is, of sensation. In the first place, the spiritists are convinced that disembodied souls can remain spectators of terrestrial life, and, consequently, can perceive it without the interposition of organs. On the other hand, some German authors have recently maintained, by rather curious reasoning, that the specific energy of our nervous system does not transform the excitants, and that our sensations are the faithful copies of that which causes them. Finally, various philosophers read Hamilton and, in our own days, the deep and subtle mind of M. Bergson, have proposed to admit that by direct comprehension we have cognizance of the objects without mystery, and as they are. Let this be admitted. It will change nothing in our conclusions, and for the following reasons. We have said that no kind of our sensations, neither the visual, the tactile, nor the muscular, permits us to represent to ourselves the inmost structure of matter, because all sensations, without exception, are false, as copies of material objects. We are now assured that we are mistaken, and that our sensations are all true, that is to say, are faithful copies of the objects. If all are true, it comes to the same thing as if all are false. If all are true, it is impossible to make any choice among them, to retain only the sensations of sight and touch, and to use them in the construction of a mechanical theory, to the exclusion of the others. For it is impossible for us to explain some by the others. If all are equally true, they all have the same right to represent the structure of matter, and as they are irreconcilable, no theory can be formed from their synthesis. Let us consequently conclude this. Whatever hypothesis may be built up on the relations possibly existing between matter and our sensations, we are forbidden to make a theory of matter in the terms of our sensations. That is what I think of matter, understood as the inmost structure of bodies, of unknowable and metaphysical matter. I shall not speak of it again, and henceforth, when I use the word matter, it will be in quite a different acceptation. It will be empirical and physical matter, such as it appears to us in our sensations. It must therefore be understood that from this moment we change our ground. We leave the world of noumena and enter that of phenomena. Definition of mind Generally, to define the mind, we oppose the concept of mind to the concept of matter, with the result that we get extremely vague images in our thoughts. It is preferable to replace the concepts by facts, and to proceed to an inventory of all mental phenomena. Now, in the course of this inventory, we perceive that we have continually to do with two orders of elements, which are united in reality, but which our thought may consider as isolated. One of these elements is represented by those states which we designate by the name of sensations, images, emotions, etc. The other element is the consciousness of these sensations, the cognition of these images, the fact of experiencing these emotions. It is, in other words, a special activity of which these states are the object and, as it were, the point of application, an activity which consists in perceiving, judging, comparing, understanding, and willing. To make our inventory orderly, let us deal with these two elements separately, and begin with the first. 
we will first examine sensation. Let us put aside that which is the fact of feeling, and retain that which is felt. Thus defined, and slightly condensed, what is sensation? Until now we have employed the word in the very vague sense of a tertium quid interposed between the object and ourselves. Now we have to be more precise, and to inquire whether sensation is a physical or a mental thing. I need not tell you that on this point every possible opinion has been held. My own opinion is that sensation should be considered as a physical phenomenon. Sensation, be it understood, in the sense of impression felt, and not in that of capacity to feel. Here are the arguments I invoke for the support of my thesis. In the first place, popular opinion, which identifies matter with what we see and with what we touch, that is to say, with sensation. This popular opinion represents a primitive attitude, a family possession which we have the right to retain, so long as it is not proved to us to be false. Next, this remark, that by its mode of apparition at once unexpected, the revealer of new cognitions, and independent of our will, as well as by its content, sensation sums up for us all we understand by matter, physical state, outer world. Colour, form, extent, position in space are known to us as sensations only. Sensation is not a means of knowing these properties of matter, it is these properties themselves. What objections can be raised against my conclusion? One has evidently the right to apply the term psychological to the whole sensation, taken en bloc, and comprising in itself both impression and consciousness. The result of this terminology will be that, as we know nothing except sensations, the physical will remain unknowable, and the distinction between the physical and the mental will vanish. But it will eventually be re-established under other names by utilizing the distinction I have made between objects of cognition and acts of cognition, a distinction which is not verbal and results from observation. What is not permissible is to declare that sensation is a psychological phenomenon, and to oppose this phenomenon to physical reality, as if this latter could be known to us by any other method than sensation. If the opinion I uphold be accepted, if we agree to see in sensation, understood in a certain way, a physical state, it will be easy to extend this interpretation to a whole series of different phenomena. To the images, first, which proceed from sensations, since they are recurring sensations, to the emotions also, which, according to recent theories, result from the perception of the movements which are produced in the heart, the vessels, and the muscles, and finally, to effort, whether of will or of attention, which is constituted by the muscular sensations perceived, and consequently also results from corporeal states. The consequences must be clearly remarked. To admit that sensation is a physical state is to admit, by that very fact, that the image, idea, emotion and effort, all those manifestations generally ascribed to the mind alone, are also physical states. What, then, is the mind? And what share remains in all these phenomena, from which it seems we are endeavouring to oust it? The mind is in that special activity which is engaged in sensation, image, idea, emotion, and effort. For a sensation to be produced, there must be, as I said a little time ago, two elements, the something felt, a tree, a house, an animal, a titillation, an odour, and also the fact of feeling this something, the consciousness of it, the judgment passed on it, the reasoning applied to it, in other terms, the categories which comprehend it. From this point of view, the dualism contained in sensation is clearly expressed. Sensation as a thing felt, 
that is, the physical part, or matter, sensation as the fact of feeling or of judging, that is, the mind. Mark the language I use. We say that matter is something felt, but we do not say, for the sake of symmetry, that the mind is the something which feels. I have used a more cautious and, I think, a more just formula, which places the mind in the fact of feeling. Let me repeat again, at the risk of appearing too subtle. The mind is the act of consciousness. It is not a subject which has consciousness. For a subject, let it be noted, a subject which feels, is an object of cognition. It forms part of the other group of elements, the group of sensations. In practice, we represent by mind a fragment of our own biography, and by dint of pains we attribute to this fragment the faculty of having a consciousness. We make it the subject of the relation subject-object. But this fragment, being constituted of memories and sensations, does not exactly represent the mind, and does not correspond to our definition. It would rather represent the mind sensationalized or materialized. From this follows the curious consequence that the mind is endowed with an incomplete existence. It is like form, which can only be realized by its application to matter of some kind. One may fancy a sensation continuing to exist, to live and to provoke movements, even after ceasing to be perceived. Those who are not uncompromising idealists readily admit this independence of the objects with regard to our consciousness, but the converse is not true. It is impossible to understand a consciousness existing without an object, a perception without a sensation to be perceived, an attention without a point of application, an empty wish which should have nothing to wish for, in a word, a spiritual activity acting without matter on which to act, or more briefly still, mind without matter. Mind and matter are correlative terms, and on this point I firmly believe that Aristotle was much closer to the truth than many modern thinkers. I have convinced myself that the definition of mind at which we have just arrived is, in its exactness and soberness, the only one which permits psychology to be distinguished from the sciences nearest to it. You know that it has been discovered in our days that there exists a great difficulty in effecting this delimination. The definitions of psychology, hitherto proposed, nearly all have the defect of not agreeing with the one thing defined. Time fails us to review them all, but I shall point out one at least, because our discussion on this particular formula will serve as a preparation for taking in hand the last question that remains to be examined, the relation of the mind to the body. According to the definition I am aiming at, psychology would be the science of internal facts, while the other sciences deal with the external. Psychology, it has also been said, has as its instrument introspection, while the natural sciences work with the eye, the touch, the ear, that is to say, with the senses of extrospection. To this distinction, I reply that in all sciences there exist but two things, sensations and the consciousness which accompanies them. A sensation may belong to the inner or the outer world through accidental reasons, without any change in its nature. The sensation of the outer world is the social sensation which we share with our fellows. If the excitant which provokes it is included in our nervous system, it is the sensation which becomes individual, hidden to all except ourselves, and constituting a microcosm by the side of a macrocosm. What importance can this have, since all the difference depends on the position occupied by the excitant? But we are persistently told there are in reality two ways of arriving at the cognition of objects, from within and from without. These two ways are as opposite as the right and wrong side of a stuff. It is in this sense 
that psychology is the science of the within, and looks at the wrong side, while the natural sciences reckon, weigh, and measure the right side. And this is so true, they add, that the same phenomenon absolutely appears under two forms radically different from each other according as they are looked at from one or the other of the two points of view. Every one of our thoughts, they point out to us, is in correlation with a particular state of our cerebral matter. Our thought is the subjective and mental face. The correspondent cerebral process is the objective and material face. Though this dualism is frequently presented as an observed truth, I think it is possible to show its error. Take an example. I look at the plain before me and see a flock of sheep pass through it. At the same time, an observer, armed with a microscope à la Jules Verne, looks into my brain and observes there a certain molecular dance which accompanies my visual perception. Thus, on the one hand, is my representation. On the other, a dynamic state of the nerve cells. This is what constitutes the right and the wrong sides of the stuff. We are told, see how little resemblance there is in this, a representation is a psychical, and a movement of molecules a material thing. But I, on the contrary, think there is a great resemblance. When I see the flock passing, I have a visual perception. The observer who, by the hypothesis, is at that moment looking into my brain, also experiences a visual perception. Granted, they are not the same perception. How could they be the same? I am looking at the sheep. He is looking at the interior of my brain. It is not astonishing that, looking at the objects so different, we should receive images also very different. But, notwithstanding their difference of object, that is, of content, there are here two visual perceptions composed in the same way, and I do not see by what right it can be said that one represents a material, the other a physical phenomenon. In reality, each of these perceptions has a twofold and psychophysical value, physical in regard to the object to which it applies, and psychical inasmuch as it is an act of perception, that is to say, of consciousness. For one is just as much psychical as the other, and as much material, for a flock of sheep is as material a thing as is my brain. If we keep this conclusion in our minds, when we come to make a critical examination of certain philosophical systems, we shall easily see the mistake they make. Spiritualism rests on the conception that the mind can subsist and work in total independence of any tie to matter. It is true that, in details, spiritualists make some modification in this absolute principle in order to explain the perceptions of the senses and the execution of the orders of the will. But the duality, the independence, and the autonomy of the soul and the body remain, in any case, the particular dogma of the system. This dogma appears to me utterly false. The mind cannot exist without matter, to which it is applied, and to the principle of heterogeneity, so often invoked to forbid all commerce between the two substances, I reply by appealing to intuition, which shows us the consciousness and its different forms, comparison, judgment, and reasoning, so closely connected with sensation that they cannot be imagined as existing with an isolated life. Materialism, we know, argues quite differently. It imagines that a particular state of the nerve centers has the virtue of generating a psychical phenomenon, which represents, according to various metaphors, property, function, effect, and even secretion. Critics have often asked how, with matter in motion, a phenomenon of thought could be explained or fabricated. It is very probable that those who admit this material genesis of thought represent it to themselves under the form of something subtle, like an electric spark, a puff of wind, a will-o'-the-wisp, or an alcoholic flame. Materialists are not alone responsible for these inadequate metaphors, which proceed from a metaphysics 
constructed of concepts. Let us recollect exactly what a psychical phenomenon is. Let us banish the will-o'-the-wisps, replace them by a precise instance, and return to the visual perception we took as an example a little while back. Without intending a pun, revenons à nos moutons. These sheep which I see in the plain are as material, as real, as the cerebral movement which accompanies my perception. How then is it possible that this cerebral movement, a primary material fact, should engender this secondary material fact, this collection of complicated beings which form a flock? Before going any further, let us invite another philosophical system to take a place within the circle of our discussion, for the same answer will suffice for it as well as for the preceding one, and it will be as well to deal with both at once. This new system, parallelism, in great favour at the present day, appears to me to be a materialism perfected, especially in the direction of caution. To escape the mystery of the genesis of the mind from matter, this new system places them parallel to each other and side by side, we might almost say experimentally, so much do parallelists try to avoid talking metaphysics. But their position is untenable, and they likewise are the victims of the mirage of concepts, for they consider the mental as capable of being parallel to the physical without mingling with it, and of subsisting by itself and with a life of its own. Such a hypothesis is only possible by reason of the insufficient definition given to the mind. If it be recognized that the mind has an incomplete existence and is only realized by its incarnation in matter, the figure which is the basis of parallelism becomes indefensible. There is no longer on the one hand the physical and on the other the mental, but on one side the physical and the mental combined, and on the other the same combination, which amounts to saying that the two faces to a reality, which was thought had been made out to be so distinct, are identical. There are not two faces, but one face, and the monism, which certain metaphysicians struggle to arrive at by a mysterious reconciliation of the phenomenal duality within the unity of the noumenon, need not be sought so far afield, since we already discover it in the phenomenon itself. The criticisms I have just pointed out to you, only too briefly, are to be found in several philosophers, confusedly in Berkeley, and with more precision in M. Bergson's book on Matière et Mémoire. The latter author, remarking that our brain and the outer world are to us images of the same order, refuses to admit that the brain, which is only a very small part of these images, can explain and contain the other and much larger part, which comprises the vast universe. This would amount to saying that the whole is comprised in the part. I believe that this objection is analogous to the one just stated with less ingenuity. It is interesting to see how M. Bergson gets out of the difficulty which he himself raised, being unwilling to bring forth from the molecular movement of the brain the representation of the world, or to superpose the representation on this movement as in the parallelist hypothesis, he has arrived at a theory, very ingenious but rather obscure, which consists in placing the image of the world outside the brain, this latter being reduced to a motor organ which executes the orders of the mind. We thus have four philosophical theories, which, while trying to reconcile mind with matter, give to the representation a different position in regard to cerebral action. The spiritualist asserts the complete independence of the representation in relation to cerebral movement. The materialist places it after, the parallelist by the side of the cerebral movement. M. Bergson puts it in the front. I must confess that the last of these systems, that of M. Bergson, presents many difficulties. As he does not localize the mind and the body, he is obliged to 
place our perception, that is to say, a part of ourselves, in the objects perceived, for example, in the stars when we were looking at them. The memory is lodged in distant places of consciousness which are not otherwise defined. We understand with difficulty these emigrations, these crumblings into morsels of our mind. This would not matter if our author did not go so far as to maintain that the sensory nerves of the brain are not sensory nerves, and that the severance of them does not suppress sensations, but simply the motor efforts of these sensations. All the physiologist in me protests against the rashness of these interpretations. The principal difficulties of the problem of the union between the mind and the body proceed from the two following facts, which seem incompatible. On the one hand, our thought is conditioned by a certain intracerebral movement of molecules and atoms, and on the other hand, this same thought has no consciousness of this molecular movement. It does not know the path of the wave in our nerves. It does not suspect, for example, that the image of the objects is reversed in the retina, or that the excitements of the right eye, for the most part, go into the left hemisphere. In a word, it is no anatomist. It is a very curious thing that our consciousness enters into relation only with the extracerebral, the external objects, and the superficies of our bodies. From this, this exact question suggests itself. A molecular wave must come as far as our visual cerebral center for us to have the perception of the object before our eyes. How is it that our consciousness is unaware of this physiological event from which it depends, and is borne towards the distant object as if it sprang forth outside our nervous system. Let us first remark that if we do not perceive this wave, yet it must contain all we know of the external object, for it is evident that we only know of that part of its properties which it transmits to our nerves and our nerve centres. All the known substance of our external object is, then, implied in this vibration. It is there, but it is not there by itself. The vibration is the work of two collaborators. It expresses at once the nature of the object which provokes it, and the nature of the nerve apparatus which transports it, as the pharaoh, traced in the wax of the phonograph, implies the joint action of an aerial vibration with a stylus, a cylinder, and a clockwork apparatus. I therefore suppose, and it is, I say it plainly, but an hypothesis, that if the nervous vibration so little resembles the external excitant which generates it, it is because the factor nervous system superadds its effect to the factor excitant. Let us imagine, now, that we have managed to separate these two effects, and we shall understand that then the nervous event, so analysed, might resemble only the object, or only the nervous system. Now, of these two effects, one is constant, that one which represents the action of the nervous system. There is another which varies with each new perception, and even with every moment of the same perception, that is to say, the object. It is not impossible to understand that the consciousness remains deaf to the constant, and sensitive to the variable element. There is a law of consciousness which has often been described, and fresh applications of which are met with daily. This is, that the consciousness only maintains itself by change, whether this change results from the exterior by impressions received, or is produced from the interior by movements of the attention. Let us here apply this empirical law, and admit that it contains a first principle. It will then be possible for us to understand that the consciousness formed into a dialyzer of the undulation may reject the constant element which expresses the contribution of the nervous system, and may lay bare the variable element which corresponds to the object, so that an intestinal movement of the cerebral substance, brought to light by this analytical consciousness, 
may become the perception of an object. By accepting this hypothesis, we restore to the sensory nerves and to the encephalic centres their properties of being the substrata of representation, and avoid the objection made above against materialism and parallelism, that they did not explain how a cerebral movement, which is material, can engender the perception of an object which differs greatly from it, and is yet as material as the movement itself. There is not here, properly speaking, either generation, transformation, or metamorphosis. The object to be perceived is contained in the nerve current. It is, as it were, rolled up in it, and it must be made to go forth from the wave to be seen. This last is the work of the consciousness. End of Book 3, Chapter 6 Recapitulation And End of the Mind and the Brain By Alfred Binet